What I mean, it's entertainment. Mm. It's, it's, it's always said it's like a, it's a, it's a public service sort of industry, really. You're providing a service and you're, and not a service, it's like, um, you're, you're really like, um, provide, providing entertainment and a release to people for what they do is, you know, you're, you really are a servant in a sense. You know, you're not, I don't see it as a pyramid where you're at the top and people at the bottom. I see it as something more inverted than that. Mm. You know, the people at the top and without them, you can't, you know, you can't, they don't put, no bums on seats means you aren't, you're singing to an empty auditorium and mm. you, you need the fans. And it, there's some sort of reciprocating uh, participation in the whole thing, you know, mm. the hearing, the performing, the receiving of it, the, the giving back the energy from the crowd. Without it, you're screwed. Killer, killer, podcast. Killer, killer, official dot com. Street Culture TV. Beatbox created. Killer, killer. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer, killer podcast. Yo, ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London, as central as you need to be, choose to be, could be, you know, the drill, you don't want to be anywhere else. Um, big shout out to our sponsors, Hoddle Warriors crew over at the Crypto Moon Boys Hideout, that's some NFT business for you. If you've got the television app, free download, iPhone, Android, for your sport and art, your street culture, sports and all that, yeah, just go and grab it, yeah? Part of your lifestyle, your, your daily five a day. Uh, this being one of them, we are inside the podcast today with a very special guest. Now, as you know, we venture into all different types of genres within the street culture, sports, soul in the world of soul. We have the likes of Kelly LaRock, Terry Walker. We've had some Dons pass through. <laughs> but this gentleman, from the early doors onwards of UK soul, uh, and the re-emergence, and then the heydays, the lows, the demores, the highs, the everythings. Kenny Thomas inside the place. How are you, my brother? How are you? <laughs> Good keep, to see you, UK Keller. soul represented inside the place. OG status. <laughs> wow. It's a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> You're in trouble now, yeah, right? I know, I know. I've had it. I've had it. It's we, all over. Yeah, we were having a little chat before, we, yeah. before jumping in here. I, 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 I cannot believe the organicness of how you came into the game and it was from the most alternative of places yeah let's start from the beginning because i ain't wasting any time on this one we've done the pleasantries let's get into the nuts and bolts where did it begin for you Kate? okay when? where did it actually begin music for me began on a very cold dark winter's night in up near stoke newington and uh not far from there in that that sort of uh the, the part of East London was Eddie Grant's studio, as and one was, does. Yeah, it was called the uh, the Coach House, and I was singing to a guy. And he really liked my voice. He said, "Let me take you under my wing and and look after you." And um, he was very much into his music, sort of a real Stamford Hill East End Jewish guy. And he said, "I know the right people." So uh, he knew Eddie Grant's brother Patrick, who was running the studio. And if you if you start to scratch a little bit beneath the surface with some of the musicians in London, you realise a lot of them, especially on the black side of music, they kind of did their initiation and their rite of passage through that studio, which really? was called Coach House. Coach House. So a lot of good musicians came through there and did their, especially like you know players like keys and bass and stuff. And so. Basically, we went round there and on a cold winter night, we bumped into Patrick, opened the door, and he said, you've got to hear this, this guy's voice, let's make a record. Someone in Hatton Garden, who had a few, a few bob, uh, another Jewish guy in Hatton Garden, put up some money, and we made a couple of records with, with Eddie Grant's brother. And Eddie came in and listened to it once and said, you know, remarked and said, I had a really good pop voice and whatever, it's soulful and stuff. Eddie Grant says that? Yeah, and so Ooh. we did that, and but... So you got all the expectations, all the optimism as a youngster, but it really did amount to not much at all. And it kind of, uh, we, we walked it into a minor record company, a record company where The Equals used to be on, which was a President Records. And it really fizzled. We got it into a few clubs. It didn't have the traction, didn't have the ground swell on it. Mm. So it, it, I, with my tail between my legs, I sort of went back to a nine to five and I thought, right, this hasn't worked. Regroup, go back to work, got to earn some money. I don't want to lay about and do... Jack Diddley, you mm -hmm. know. So how old were you at that time? I was about, I reckon I was about, at that point, 19, 20, yeah. Mm. And then what happened was I, was I was working away and eventually my final job ever, because I worked in banking in the city, um, 
and then I, was, I ended up my final job that I had before I busted into the, the scene and got the, the deal and went professional, as they say, was for British Telecom and I was working down the West End. You could call it work, but most of the time I was messing around with the other people, the guys and girls at, at the place. We were, you know, skiving off and going for a beer down the road. As you do. The usual West End <laughs> stuff, you know. And it was a great laugh and I'm still in, I'm still in touch with some of those people now, real, real good friends. And um, But it was at that time... I was still beginning to make some demos and get into the studio and make make records and write some songs, and it was at that time that my dad was called by by a guy in the in the music game and said in the boxing game and said, "Look, I've got a guy who's boxing. It's his first match, his first contest. He's quite a tasty fighter." And he said, "Would you look after him and take him to the show?" My dad was obviously he's an ex pro. My dad ran a boxing club for thirty years, um, and oh. so he was going to be his corner man. The guy's name was Steve Finan. And the fellow, just as a little aside conversation, he said he knew that he knew that my dad's, you know, that my dad's son, me, he was Ken Senior, I was Ken Junior. Uh, he said, you know what, he knew he was, I was into music. He said, by the way, he said, this guy manages some sort of rapper called Moni Love. Mm. And she'd already had some chart hits. Mm. So my dad, armed with this knowledge, he, he went to a boxing show that night and took Steve Farnham with him. And then he, at some point in the journey, popped those famous few words, which was, um, oh, by the way, my, my son can sing. He asked him what he did. And he said, oh, I'm involved in music, Steve Forrest. He said, oh, my son can sing. Now, normally at that point, that's what you don't want to hear. Yeah, yeah. When someone says my son can sing, it's like, it's a, it's a red oh, flag. Yeah. <laughs> but he gave it the benefit of the doubt. And he said, yeah. you know what? Let me come around your house and listen to what your son's done, some demos. And that following weekend, he came around the house, listened to it. He said, I like it. I love your voice. The songs aren't quite right. Let's get in a studio and make a record. And within a few weeks, we went into a studio in Acre Lane, Brixton, mm -hmm. and we recorded um, Outstanding. Wow, that is, I mean, think quite about fast. that, that timeline and how that, the intro from boxing. Yes. Crazy. Yes. Just by fluke. These, these, these stories, they're, they're told so flippantly, but, you know, just one element of yep. that story if that didn't happen accidental an yeah. accidental almost you know it just uh you say it's meant to be really yeah. Yeah. would i've got there another way would i have bumped into steve fire and other people in the scene cause going out and get, going to the dmc stuff and all of that possibly so do you want you talk dmc's hold on <laughs> dmc's dj mixing championships the world dmc's you so what you were you you were part of that no Tell me the just, just always a punter, uh -huh, really. Uh -huh. Just just watching, enjoying the mixing, the scratching, all the rest of it. You know, very much part of, of that. And and obviously, Finan, who ended up managing me, Steve Finan, he knew Pogo and he knew all of that crowd. So I got introduced to DJ Pogo, and he came out on the road with us on some wow. of the tours and opened up the show playing. You know, wow. We went out on the road with Moni Love. Big up Pogo. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. He's cool. Right there, He's yeah. cool, dude. <sighs> So I would have might have met a lot of these people eventually because you're doing the rounds in London. And aren't you're you? kind of in you're in your passion place. You're in the environments where you like. Yeah. But uh, whose hands you would have ended up in and how it would have turned out and what records you would have made, all of those things, you know, that they they are met they they only happen with the right people around you. Yeah, yeah. I think I think there's a lot of that. You got me thinking actually in terms of the the climate being so hip hop centric. Mm. Early hip hop for the yep. UK. I'm not talking early, early. This is a this was a, a time of, um, you know, like you say, Moni Love, Nana Cherry. We'll yep. get into that in a bit. But, yes. but you know, soul music. Um, I remember acts like Princess and the, you know, EWL, that was. Yeah, yeah. Believe it or not. Bro, Pink yeah, Walton, I know. That's yeah. crazy. One of their more cooler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good it, respects, yeah. yeah. Um, but then, you know, of, of uh, other um, regions and Countries, people like SOS Band. Yes. Um, what else we got? I mean, well, the 80s, you had the huge American rhythm and blues Im yeah. imports coming yeah, in. Yeah. The soul explosion in the 80s was, was yeah. incredible. But you, you had this there, there was this, there was this harmonious relationship, I felt, that as a kid watching, there was this really cool UK soul slash um, pre New Jack Swing rhythm to to new new waves of a soul yes and then there was hip-hop and they they kind of worked in the same club they kind of yes had the same dance didn't they yes yeah there were there was a, there was a, a an area where they there was a huge overlap yeah before it began to move on and separate and then you had sort of the arrival of real american album r&b exploded through the 90s and there were starts things started started to separate slightly mm. but there was a point back then where 
you know, things were, were very much together. I mean, you could also see that on the house scene, you'd go to somewhere like, if you're my age, I'm sort of 54 now, and you're, you're sort of slowly doing your initiation at Camden Palace mm. in 1988, as Danny Rampling's beginning to usher in the Summer of Love, Whoa. you know? So you're doing that, and you've got like, all of you've got people. some hardcore acid tunes oh, dropping, shit. all right? And then the DJ at the end of it would be dropping Soul to Soul. Yeah. Ending it with soul to soul and stuff like that. So you had this real mix. Before things started to separate, as the years went on, you got like, what, what kind of house is that? Oh, it's hard house, deep house. I think as a magazine's house, playing yeah. that game as well. They played yeah, it kind of like separated out. So, but there used to be real overlaps and things were, were very much together. And the soul scene was like that. It did, it did lend itself to all those areas. I would say if you was asking me about myself, I would say that I was probably, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, and it's an obviously it's a, it's a purely subjective uh, a view and opinion. I think that I was probably the very last artist to come in the 90s and extend it for as long as I could mm. to 93, 94, 95, we're still putting out records, yeah. of a sound that was essentially 80s. Yes, that's right. I, could, I, yeah. I, I concur. I yeah. agree. Um, and no one else really quite was attempting to do that. Uh, obviously, now you fast forward 30 years on, well, the 80s sound has come back round, the 90s yeah. sound, even, the, do, even the, you know, the keys, the, the, the synths, the, yeah. the drums. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Full circle. Um, yeah, so, if you know, dropping associative names like Omar, yes. Naina Cherry, these these people of their time. Yeah, you you fall, you walk yeah. the same kind of, you're in the same paddock of... of, of uh, yeah, we're all in. Yeah, we're in the same sort of area, same mm. same ballpark. Mm. And you knew you knew of Nana and Cameron. Big up Nana Cameron. Yeah, big up. Uh, yeah, Cameron. Last I told you, last time I saw Cameron was down at uh, Big Cram Yoga in Kentish <laughs> Town, and we were half naked and uh, sweating in that room. That was a while back now. Um, Fly on the wall. <laughs> God, oh my God. <laughs> we were doing something good for our bodies. That's right. <laughs> I recommend it for a change. Yeah. <laughs> for us, a change. As musician yeah. types, you know, yeah, you got to do all the damage you did in the nineties. Yeah. Right now, the the thing with Nana. First time I met Nana was Steve Fine and said to me, "I wanted to come and meet Nana," and I was I was unsigned, unknown, just really starting mm. out essentially and I went down and hung out with Nena for the day with Cameron and all that and we went off to took us to Wem took me to Wembley mm. so and we went to it was a concert to celebrate the release of Nelson Mandela and Winnie Mandela was there got oh, to meet her oh man I remember this vividly yeah and I went to along and hung out with them so you remember I'm sort of my whole life I've bought huge amounts of vinyl of, of artists and there I am side of the stage Look at Wembley, watching George Duke soundtrack, um, Natalie Cole sing, Anita Baker. You're watching all these, and I'm like, whoa. You know, I was just, as a kid, I grew up buying these records, <laughs> and I was hanging out. But it, I, the odd thing about it, it felt like a very natural place to be. It felt like I'm meant to be here. Mm. I'm meant to be by this stage. I'm meant to be in this company. Mm. And as the years went on, and I'm going, beginning to do gigs with the likes of your Lisa Stansfield and your Alexander O'Neill's and your Bobby Womax and... And Patrice Rush. Get a fucking royalty in this building, yeah. bro. I swear to God. This so is as odd. I'm as I'm doing that and I'm beginning to hang out and go to LA and hang out and, and party relatively hard, mm -hmm. as, well, as hard as I could, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. Um and you're meeting like sort of the Isley brothers and Angela Wimbush and all of those. They are they are black soul music royalty, you know. They mm. really are. They're what you aspire to be, they're they're everything you you thought it would be, and all the records you it's bought. Fucking too early. What it's all about? Too early for this conversation, yeah, man. Bruv. This is never too early for that. <laughs> you must be on all the time. This, this, this. Yeah. This, so this, this is that was a mind blowing moment, but it was it was also like an introduction. Like this is the world you're meant to drift into and be in. Yeah, but how to much? Whatever you, level. Yeah, yeah, but but okay. So there is this. I, I get where you're coming from. Of this, um, right place meant to be. It feels like you're putting your you're hand home, in the glove. You're at home with it. Exactly. Yeah. But there, but then there is the likes of a show public out there that would genuinely say to you, "Bro, that's not normal." <laughs> uh, no, Should, no, there's nothing normal happen, about it. There's no. nothing normal about that. But it, there is something quite normal about it, in a way, because when you get to sort of meet these people and they're really like super, super famous or successful, and they're like the Isley Brothers and stuff, and you're having conversations with them, and you're just, you know, as they say in America, shooting the shit. Mm. It, you realise, man, they're really normal too, and everything's so normal. Mm. We just just do something different for a living. It's just a different gift. 
Mm. You know, believe me, if if I if you know if I burst a pipe at home, I, the singing's no good for me. I, I need I need a plumber. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I need someone who knows what he's doing in that department, and I know what I'm doing in mine. You know, Google below. Said, take, take comment below on that one. <laughs> and it's entertainment. Do you know what I mean? It's entertainment. Mm. It's, it's it's always said it's like a it's a it's a public service sort of industry. Really, you're providing a service, and you're and not a service. It's like um. You're really like um, providing provide entertainment and a release to people for what they do is, you know, you're, you really are a servant in a sense. You know, you're not, I don't see it as a pyramid where you're at the top and people at the bottom. I see it as something more inverted than that. You mm. know, the people at the top and without them, you can't, you know, you can't, they don't put, no bums on seats means you aren't, you're singing to an empty auditorium and mm. you, know, you need the fans and it, there's some sort of reciprocating. Uh, participation in the whole thing, you know, the mm. hearing, the performing, the receiving of it, the, the giving back the energy from the crowd. Without it, you're screwed. That that mentality that you hold there, I mean, and, and it's extremely humble and gracious, but I also understand where it comes from um, because as working class as us gentlemen can be, mm. your, your father comes from a, a boxing yes. um, background. So it really is... It really is for want of a better term, grunt work where you put out, put in what you get out. And, yes. and that's that's a work ethic that comes from, it clearly has transferred yeah. into your way. And it's entertaining as well, boxing, whether you yeah. like it or loathe it, I like it, but I it is entertaining. It. Yeah. You know. <laughs> it's, it's all of that. But you get out what you put in. Yeah. My friend Arrow said to me on the last on podcast I was with him, he goes, because he, uh, he knows me from back in the day, and he goes, he goes, Lee... There's always a bricklayer's job in 1993 waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always say, but it's too late for that for that sort of building course now. If I've done, if I had my chance, I'm going to learn off my learn the building game off my father because he was in the building game, and I've got friends who still are, and they're very good at it. But mm. um, no, that's 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 gone. So you end up sort of pursuing what you do and what you love, and you realise it's both a blessing and a curse at yeah. the same time. Do you do you feel like right? And I have this conversation sometimes. You're an awesome person to ask this. In your late teens, mm. mid-twenties, you're thinking it because you want to become it. Yeah. When you hit your thirties and your forties, you've become it. Yeah. There's no going back after your forties. It's like, no. do, you, do, you, do you feel that? Do you feel that moment of like, uh, I've embodied everything that I said I wanted to do I, and I can't just go and, you know, I don't know where to begin. Like, yeah. I can't just Will change you, this. Well... Yes, yes, and no. In, 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 in terms of music, for me, I'm always pursuing the next record, the next song. Mm. I don't view it as I've arrived or I hit the top. I always view it as like that. Right, once you've done it, that's gone. Mm. So you're always striving to make music, and I think my driving, as much as you need money and material things to survive in this world, my, my driving force has always been the music. Mm. So, and I've always felt if I get that right. If I get that right, it's like the first button on the shirt. You get that one right, the others fall into place. So if I get, if I pursue money, if I pursue wealth and the rest of it, and some people do, and they're very successful at doing mm-hmm. that, I figure, I think that first button on the shirt is going to go wrong, and they won't fall into place. So I'll, I'll get what I want. I say I'll win the lottery. I'll get what I want. Doesn't necessarily mean mean it'll be the best thing for me. Yeah. It won't save me. Actually, it might destroy me. So I, I aim at music. And everything else seems to follow and it's provided for in some strange way. Now, in terms of do you think that it's over and there's nothing else to do, I kind of undid that theory for myself because in 2010, in 2007, purely out of curiosity and being a bit of a bookworm and wanting to know the ins and outs of a cat's bottom, that's a bit like me. I want Mm. to know Mm. as much as I can about everything. Not to be a know-it-all because I just think that the moment I I stop you know, I prevent my brain from learning new things. I think then you're you're en route to a, a, a you know a chair in a nursing home. And no disrespect, I've seen that. I saw my father go there with Alzheimer's. You know, and I cared yeah. for him for years. Real with talk, yeah, yeah, real talk. So I just think that the brain we have got the capacity to keep learning. So in 2007, in some sort of mad moment, I I, I decided to do a bachelor of science degree in Chinese medicine. So, and I slogged that out. My goodness, my vision was 2020 before that. After sitting up till four in the morning doing modules and dissertations and the rest of it, my vision by the end of it was, was not as good as it, as it started out because I was just spevering in the, on a computer at night and buried in the books. But anyway, and sticking lots of needles and whatever in lots of people. Wow. But the thing is, the end result of that is in 2010, I then passed the Bachelor of Science degree in Chinese medicine. And then since 2010, I've gone off on some mad tangents in terms of holistic, uh, alternative, complementary medicine. 
I mean, even in the last two weeks, and I'm, we're not going to go on a tangent here, I promise you, because you'll need an exit strategy if I get on this one. <laughs> you really will. It's got a passion here. Yeah. <laughs> but I've even discovered a very, very new carbon molecule that's been around, that's discovered in 85, and what they're doing with it is applications for health, it's applications, it's probably the most powerful antioxidant going, more power, 273 times more powerful than vitamin C. Anyway, so now I'm beginning to really start to research this one particular molecule, which is called Buckminster Fullerene oh, C60. Buckminster. C60. Google it, check it out. Early days, but check it out. 85, you said this, this, this. 85 it was discovered. It was one of the first carbons to be discovered for, for hundreds of years anyway. But I've just been spending the last few weeks delving into that. So as well as music, I just think that, you know what, why should I stop learning? Why should I not, why should I stop discovering? So I'm a bit of an, uh, an anomaly, really. I've always been one of those, I was one of those kids in the playground. I had loads of mates and all the rest of it. But I was one of those kids that just stood there at times and thought, hmm. I don't belong here. I don't fit no, there's in. Something, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do know exactly what you mean. It's either true or you're actually like you've lost your marbles. Yeah, I think that I th I think um, that's that's wasted mm -hmm. opportunities like that and time to be that way is often lost on the youth. You know, nowadays, you know, because you know, for whatever reason, technology yes. does a lot of things. But one thing it does do is find these molecules. You are able to you research. Can research. Again. Do you got, think? Got do it at your fingertips. Yeah, you got it at your fingertips, and and you're able to. Um, you can pick up whatever you mm. are interested in and, yes. and really delve like you have with um, the, the... Don't stop learning. Yeah, with medicines. Don't stop striving. Wait, my, my, where my mind went as you were talking about this was, above, like, it's the same process as writing. It's like you always find music producers are really good cooks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nine times that. You know what I mean? That's so true. It's true, isn't it? It's That's just so true. It's because you're working with intrigue curiosity yeah. and the same with songwriting mm. it's a puzzle isn't it mm. and you go down the rabbit hole of medicine mm. because you're curious yeah you, you but you treat it in the same fun play mm. as you w would with writing songs yes and, and they're connected because they're both creative they're both sort of mysterious in a way you discover something you don't like with songwriting you discover us you write a song and think where exactly did that come from? Did we pluck that out of the ether? Mm -hmm. Did it always exist and we just discovered it? Mm. And say with medicine, it's you know it's creative. There's a scientific method, but beyond that, there's also a lot of a lot of creativity and abstract thought. Well, you know? have to be creative because yeah. you're working. It's the, it's the unknown. You're mm. still, you know there has to be play involved mm. in anything that you got going yeah. on, or else it's it's yeah it's mundane. It yeah. doesn't it doesn't fulfil the quota of what needs. You got to be that ambition. Yes, is the is the driver finding something new? Is yeah, it? <gasps> but it's interesting. Isn't it? Even the, even the, you know the, the being in the moment and aware that we're, I'm here now. You think, well, how did I get here? And this is and it's, it's such a good thing. And how many people do we know? Mm. You mentioned the name Judy Blaine. Yeah, let's rest not, in peace, let's Judy. Not the, forget Judy Blaine. Judy the God Blaine. Yeah, oh my God. Yeah. Now that's a gentleman. Yeah. That, and you said that he styled a lot of your... He did a lot of my styling. So when you see me start out in the 90s and do the uh, the early Top of the Pops, for people that remember what that show was uh -huh. all about, and you suddenly see it flip, the, the fashion and everything flip and the photo, the photo shoots change as Judy steps in and starts to bring his flair and finesse and some craziness as well, you know, because there, there was always a bit of experiment. There's some of the photo shoots, I've got them at home, all the photo shoots, not all of them got out in the end, but there's some times we experimented with some colours and mm. shapes and, and stuff that was, you know, risky. ID Magazine was kind of on its beginnings, wasn't it, of that time as well, which he had a heavy influence yes. in, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. And camera with magazines camera. were powerful back then, weren't they? Yeah, big you know, ID like your for blue, sure. Even, even in the soul world, your blues and soul, yeah. your black echoes, yes. which I was the first <gasps> and I think the first, I don't know if anyone's ever there, the first ever white face to be on the front of black echoes oh, wow. ever. And my photo shoot for that was done by Normski. Oh, Norm, <laughs> I love you, brother. Norm yeah, and we landed on the front guy. cover of Black Echoes, which later became Echoes, didn't it? It dropped the black and became Echoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it still was, you know, targeted at that demographic and that kind of yeah. audience, and rightly so. The face as well, that was another one, wasn't the it? Face. The face was there. Was, yeah. These all the inf the infancies, aren't they? Yeah. But and then you had the rise of TV shows like The Word. Yeah. Dance Codes energy were coming and all up. That. All of those were. were oh, yeah. so it was a it was a, a revolution going on, mm. but it was it was much more subtle than you realised. Mm. Uh, I don't know whether this is a, a classic question to ask you, um, but you know, in a world that, like you say, that 
fashion has cycles. The 80s comes back round, the 90s comes back round. And, and it's all about just staying on top of this because, mm. you know, you, you, you make sure you go to the gym, make sure you do take those herbalistic medicines. Yeah. You've got to keep it, you've got to stay on form. Yeah. But... Without being too OCD and obsessive yeah. about it, because you can go that way as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, totally. Totally, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, but my bigger question that I'm leading to is in, a, in an all-consuming world and nostalgia being such a huge factor, how do you, how do you process being so ingrained in the public psyche and, and your songs, you, you could just as well be turning the radio on or switching over to BBC mm. Four between Sky Arts or whatever and, you know, a classic period of compilations of yeah. your, and your song comes up. Dude, I, I, it, I couldn't even begin mm. to imagine what that's like. Mm. And it happens because they've had the reruns more recently, haven't they, of Top of the Pops, which people have said they've seen. And I, I, I see, I tend not to watch those. I'm, I'm, a really, I'm a strange dude in the sense that I didn't really watch a lot of myself on TV. Um, and people say, why don't, you, why don't you watch those things, like Top of the Pops and all this, or Wogan or Jonathan Ross? And so I was like, well, I was, I was there. I kind of know what happened. Yeah. So I'm not going to watch it back. And occasionally I accidentally may have done that or the record company insisted I watch something for a particular reason. But when you're hearing those things, it's, for me, again, it's to do with my mindset. I've always felt that my music's more important than me or my music's bigger than me. And that really was true because I could quite, in, in a very sort of hidden way, I could totally throw myself into the London night scene, fall out of a nightclub at silly o'clock in the morning in 1993, mm. along with a few other famous people, and, I, and they'd get snapped and I'd go undetected. It's like I was the boy next door. So I was having these hits, and, and it, was quite, it was quite rightly summed up by, by journalists in the Times, uh, Sunday Times, who said, you know, Kenny Thomas has, has uh, achieved enormous uh, success by stealth. Ooh. And he was right. I did it by stealth. I think you can. T- I, I would take that as with a you know a badge of honour. Yeah, because I was I was able to have a relatively normal life, as normal as I wanted it to be. It was always a bit of a struggle between the pop star thing and me trying to be as normal as I wanted to be, because I didn't really want to be anything other than just the same guy I always was. Mm. So um, so there was always a bit of a, a bit of a tug of war with that. Certainly with record companies, they'd say, "Well, you know, we need you to go to such and such," and I'd like, okay. Am I going there to see something? Because I like to go to theatre to see a show. I like to go to a concert to see something and experience mm. it. Uh, or, or am I going there to be seen? Mm. No, you're going there to be seen. I was like, well, no, it's all right. Let me know when something I want to go and watch or go and see and I'll go and see it. But I'm not going to be seen. Mm. I'm not interested. You know, so there was always mm. that. Now, when you hear that music, my music has always been bigger, I think, than I am. So my music's known. So you often hear people say they know the record, can't place the face, uh, or they, they don't can't remember who do it. And occasionally you'll still have someone, even all these years on, and say, oh, I thought you was a, a black guy. I thought you was a black singer because it sounds soulful in mm. that kind of way. And I say, well, actually, you, no, but you must have missed a lot of the TV shows and a lot of the stuff back mm-hmm. then and, and not got to see what I look like, you mm-hmm. know? Um, so you still get people who, who think it's a different artist or... Oh, some people, yeah, the other one is, oh, we thought you was American. No, oh, a good North London boy mm. or grew up in the East End as well. Yeah, 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 so, come on. Um, in that sense, I, I'm not uncomfortable with that. I'm happy for it to be bigger than I am. I, I suppose we live in a different world now. I never really achieved celebrity. I, I was a pop star. Mm-hmm. And I had my 15, as Andy Warhol would say, I had my 15 minutes of fame, you know. Maybe I extended it to 20, perhaps. And we sold a lot of records and a lot of hits and in different countries. But essentially, I still managed to be able to fall back to my default position of having a really normal life. And the music carried on as it has and as it does. Even now, the music I'm making now, oh, we're doing podcasts mm. and we're doing things, we realise it's a different creature, it's a different animal now, we're yeah. going to play a different game. Mm. But I'm still happy for the music to forge ahead in front of me and I'll just, you know, gently fall in with it. It's interesting. It's, it's, it's very observant of you to, to see that on refle- you know, outside in on, yeah. on your career path. and, mm. and But... Okay, so where there's an ego in something somewhere, always. Always. So, so if the ego isn't to be seen or to be the the the, 
the face ambassador entirely of, you know, the the, the songs of the leader. Yeah. So what what where was the tenacity? Where was your drive? Where where did that ego fit? Where how? Yeah, because we all do. You we, all do we all do have one. Yeah, yeah. And to 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 to, to say you don't is is foolish because uh, that means it's probably in yeah. charge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> <laughs> see see. Very good. It's probably in charge. It's, it's driving. It's yeah. not driving the engine, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, The truth so, hurts, don't it? Yo. Yeah. So, and that's a, and that's a real a fake humility. It's like, how do you know when you haven't got humility when you say you've got it? Yeah, because yeah, when yeah, you've got real it. humility, you don't know you've got it. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, I'm really humble, me. Oh, of course you are. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll <laughs> no, we'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> okay. So, um, I think the ego, again, I if there is one, I've always tried to funnel it into the music. Do, you know, do I, you know, do I enjoy being recognised as as like a blue-eyed soul, one of the UK's mm. blue-eyed soul singers? Yes. Are there others? There are others I love. You know, mm. there are other singers I love. There, are, there are singers out in the UK that are awesome. You know, mm. and um, then a few spring to mind. Tony Monreal mm. was a great vocalist, man. And there's there's artists that should be should be bigger than than I was or if we went back in time 30 years and those record major record companies were dishing out the deals like they were then some of these artists would be much bigger than they were this we just it's all we're all just a product of our time and i got in mm. a way i got lucky you know there was a race on for that blue eyed soul thing you had me clive griffin mm -hmm. a few others yeah. going gunning for it and i just happened to get through and part of that was the genius of steve fine and the genius of also the record company look but at the look at so, the likes of simon dunmore who was my? Who was my? Who was he? Did all the record club promotion at that yeah. called Tempo. What did he go on to do? He went on to found Glitterbox, defected. Yeah, huge, wow. huge very talented guy. Yeah. You know, he chose records for me. What do you think about doing Tender Love as a ballad to put it out for Christmas? Risky. Yeah, it's Jam and Lewis record. Totally very risky. But you know what? I'm mad enough to go for it, so we went for it and had a huge hit, reasonably, you know, relatively huge hit with mm. it, considering it was Christmas time and the sales were, were massive back then. So I think ultimately, you know, you've just got to put everything into its into its concept. And what's the ego driving it? Music. Mm. Always music. Just make a great record, write a great song, try and sing the best you've ever... People say to me, oh, your voice, you know, you've sort of... You're at the top of your game. And I always say, well, not quite. Mm. Can, you tell, can, you, can you tell... It's got better. Optimization. Soul, soul music's like fine wine. It just has to mature and get better. And, oh God, that's you good, know. Yeah. And when you see like that, when you sit there and watch the lights of uh, Bobby Womack on stage in front of you, like wow. I have, you yeah. know, this sort of this close, yeah, yeah, close yeah. As, as these lights are to me now. And, uh, and you realise the voice is so edgy, so full of life. It's been no he's been knocked, he's been hammered, he's, there's pain in there, there's angst. That's soul music. So at 22, yes, I was making reasonably good soul music. At, at 54, it's something more deeper and real. So you're still, uh, but in a nutshell, you're still learning. Still learning. Still learning. Beautiful audience, beautiful scene. And, yeah. you know, one, if, you're, if you love it so much, you, you tread with the greatest of strength knowing that you are great at what you're doing and it's all handled respectfully. And I yeah. think from your point of view, um, the fact that you weren't egotistical, you didn't drive it in a particular way as if like, yeah. you know, you were really, you were methodical, you were respectful, you, yeah. you, you just, you, uh, you not underplayed, but I think you were right when you said um, the kind of quote unquote boy next door mm. kind of... yeah persona which now even now like Ed Sheeran has that boy next to oh, in, in, in yeah he's, he's loads of it he's, yeah. got, he's got bundles of that Drugs. and but he's a great songwriter great yeah. singer and uh, and he's real you know yeah I know because he, he doesn't live you know he lives over East Anglia my part of the world and mate of mine bumped into a chip shop in a chip shop a few, <laughs> few months back <laughs> uh, in Suffolk and uh, he was just they were just Regular having a chat dudes, yeah. you know that, I like that I respect that yeah, and also you know, he goes out on stage, wears what he wants, and that's why I was always envious of of some of the Britpop stuff because they could just roll out of bed and go on stage. Yeah, and I yeah, was yeah. like, no, Kenny, you got to be, you know, like some sort of mannequin. Here we go. Totally, totally. But um, yeah, and the other and the other going back to what you said, you know, with regard to, you know, keeping it real and humble, I never had that sense of entitlement, and also, 
I, um, I do worry about some of the youngsters today that just purely want fame for fame's sake. Mm. And then you realise, you look at some of the reality shows and then on the backside of it, they're, you know, they're in depressions or even worse. They're doing yeah. something very harmful to themselves. And you think, well, I remember fame. And I remember it being at its height and being on the biggest TV shows and, and realising it's not all it's cracked up to be. And it does suddenly take your life somewhere else mm. away from what it, it, it's meant to be at times, you know. So yeah. I used to view it like a jacket. I'm going to put this jacket on today. I've got to play the fame game. Yeah. And as soon as I can get it off, boom, it's off. And I'm just going to chill with my mates or whatever, yeah. normal people. But did you see the perception, people's perceptions of you, friends kind of see a different... Because obviously of, the, of that era, you mm. know, TV was king. Yeah, I'll tell you what happened, right? When I, my first, my second top of the pops, right? My second top of the pops is very in interesting. If, if people want to know more about my story, I'm, I've got to plug something, haven't tell I? Tell it. I've, got, I've written a book and it's called Bearing My Soul, an autobiography. I finished it during just at the end of all the lockdown. It's on, yeah. it's on Amazon. It's on Amazon.com. Code.uk. Get in. And um, and that will unpack that story. It also yeah. unpacks another story. Okay, so we don't get too indulgent on this. Yeah. But, but yeah, but, but just, it unpacks yeah. another story of uh, the battle I've had for the last six years, three months with my daughter who's not been well and been dealing with, been taking her to Germany oh, for, okay. for medical treatment. So okay. it unpacks that, but it's a very interesting read. It's, a, wow. it's, a, it's an eye opener. It's, oh, wow. no, it's not a normal pop memoir. You know, it obviously explores the medicine as well, what I've studied, you know. So anyway. Oh, wow. Um, but it's a great book. But yeah. in there, what I mentioned is the second top of the... I think it was the second top of the pops I ever did. And I was on with Rebel MC and, and he had on... He had with him Barrington Levy, the Jamaican wow. yeah, singer, right? <laughs> so I'm hanging out with Barrington Levy backstage in between the takes. And, of course, we're having a bit of a chat and a catch-up. And... Uh, and I grew up with Jamaicans, as you probably, as mm. a lot of us did in London. Mm. I'm very much at home with it, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so we're, we're just having a good old chat. And he said to me, where, he said to me, where are you living now? And I said, I'm still in Hackney. And he said, yeah, I, goes, I, I like Hackney, I'm, I'm, that's where I am. And he said, you'll have to leave there. He said, I said, why? He goes, how many hits you had now? I said, well, this, I think I was on to my second hit by then, or the, it was the first, second one was up and coming, it might yeah. be the second hit. He said, you'll have to leave there. I said, why is that? And he said, People around you will change. He goes, not for the not for the for the for the better, for the worse, a lot of them will. And he goes, and you'll have to you'll have to shift from that area. Really? And he was right. As things went on, it became less and less uh, you know Pleasant. Pleasant. And then I got rumours from people that people I'd known years ago that wasn't in touch with anymore from the old council estate that I grew up on on Stamford Hill were saying, Oh yeah, so and so's out to get you. Oh, what for? What have I done? I ain't seen him in years. We were mates back then. We just lost touch. Oh, no, no, because he thinks that you've now you've become big. You've dissed them all and left them all. I was like, I haven't I've done it. Anyway, hmm. that's, the, that's how I thought, yeah, maybe I'll shift. So I'll shift over to North London. In fact, I went to Hertfordshire for a bit and got bored of that and come back in. But anyway, years later, the person that they said to me was out to get me, yeah, he, his life derailed a bit. He did a bit of bird. Mm -hmm. He probably just had an angry space. Mm -hmm. Everyone gets in an angry space now. Yeah, yeah. I bumped into him once, and it was at, it was at a kind of gig I was doing, yeah. And he was there with with with, with someone, and uh, and you know what? I remember just walking up to him, and it had been years, and I knew that he'd been said to people he was out to get me for no reason whatsoever, other than, other than the fact mm -hmm. that I'd become famous. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I did? As soon as I saw him, I just went up to him. I went, but right. mm -hmm. I just put my arms Gave around him, and we covered each other like two old mates should do mm -hmm. after twenty years. Mm -hmm. You know, and there was no reason to say anything mm. about anything. It was just like we're, we're back in this place again, now, yeah. in this space, yeah. And that's where it should be, not anywhere else, because of any other bullshit or hit records or any of that. Yeah, it takes a lot to. Um, well, maybe it doesn't. It depends the kind of person you are. But it, you've got to override these things, haven't you? Like yes, these things pass quite quickly, but but the the stain of it. You can let that mm. bear and be a be a problem, yeah. but you just got to move on. I've got my own philosophy. If you, you're getting no love from a situation, you're getting no love from someone, it's because you ain't putting no love in. Put yeah. some love in, you'll get some love out. Yeah. Believe me, if it's a real arid, dark place and it's like and it's, it's negative, pump some love into that situation. Mm. Really, just even with the intention, just the intention of it. Mm. You don't have to say much or do much. It will just come. It will come from you. 
That electromagnetic field of your heart, man, that extends out into this room, you know? That's why mm. someone can walk in and you suddenly, ooh, yeah. it's a bad vibe. Yeah, what have they yeah. done? Nothing. They've done nothing. They're pumping out an energy, man. They're pumping out a field. Yeah, Electromagnetic 100%. field that ain't right. So you do that. Have the intention of love and just put the love in. And I'll tell you, eventually, trust me, you'll get some love out. God, I love I could have gone up to him and said, I could have gone up to him and said, hey, brother, I heard you said such and such, such and such. Mm. You know what? Didn't matter. Yeah. That was, that's history. That it's doesn't exist. So well, that's gone. Yeah. It was just one of those moments. Come. Yeah, yeah. And it wipes the whole slate clean. Yes. Done. In one moment. Yeah. With I, love. I love that. I love that you think that way. I love that. I love that, you know, when you meet Dons, there's a reason why you're, you're Don. It's a reason why you're great. It's because the, the energy that's held. It's quite stoic, isn't it? We're all dons, though, aren't we? Yeah, we are dons. We're unique. There's no one else. But it's the stoicism in what you're saying that's that's the best part. Yeah, it's just re it's just realizations, and you know, and you have to make a series of mistakes to get there, though. Yeah, you have to have some different pitfalls, and you have to look back and be able to reflect and go, right, that didn't work. That did work. This must be the way. Just going back to the the BBC shows, the uh, the ITV shows. That yeah. Um, and all those different things that you've done. <laughs> like, you said you didn't watch it because you were there. You know, well, I want to mm. go, it's done now, move on. I mean, I love that, that yeah, attitude. Yeah, I've been of, like that. But, but um, you have your own interpretation of proceedings that went on to create yeah. what that three minutes on screen was. Yeah. Give me a story, right, of something <laughs> that went down in the background. Because, you know, they, they're full of these amazing stories that the, the behind the scenes shit give me a behind the scenes shit for one of the most uh, you know popular awesome moments of your of your media career oh well you mean good and bad or negative and all rest of it i mean oh don't mind oh, the one of the worst the worst one that springs to mind was my first ever doing a, a, a performing at wogan now you know a lot of shows back then were mimes they were either mm -hmm. mimes or they were live top mm -hmm. of the pops ended up going live mm -hmm. eventually purely live they backtrack on that a, a while later because they realised they couldn't cut it. A lot of the artists couldn't cut it. Mm. They invited me on, funny enough, just to do an album track because they knew I could sing live. They said, would you come and do the first Top of the Pops live, the, where it's completely live? Because they know to, you can do they it. Needed to, they needed to sort of like, you know, fill the show out. Mm. So I helped them out on that one and they helped me out because obviously I had the exposure. Now, the one that swings to mind, the biggest show, the pinnacle, was Wogan. Could you get to Wogan and do a performance at Wogan? For those outside of the UK, yeah, that, Terry was a, Wogan. Yeah, that was like a, um, uh, well, I guess... A what chat show, wasn't chat it? Show, yeah, it was a chat show. Like one it was of the biggest. Yeah, yeah, old school chat show. So we made it to Wogan. We get Wogan. But that day we had to be somewhere in the morning or somewhere the evening before doing a performance and I was with Moni Love's brother, Marvin, because he was to help me out doing a bit of road managing with me. And so we had, they flew us and they decided to fly us in some private plane. Doesn't sound like it's private, it doesn't mm -hmm. sound. It's not a private jet, right? Mm -hmm. We'll get to what it was. It was a private plane, mm -hmm. a, 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 a propeller. Plane, oh, right? oh, cool. So they're flying us from up north mm. down to be in time for the Wogan show. And um, this was like a Cessna. You know what? I've, I've jumped, I know what a Cessna is because I jumped out of one with my old man. We did parachute jumps, right? Mm. So it's like a Cessna but with, with, with more seats in it. And so no decompression in it or anything like that. And as we're going up, Marvin begins to complain of a pain in his ear and I thought maybe he's got an ear infection something like that and as as we were on, on the flight my ear started to hurt and as we're descending he was he was writhing around in pain and then so was I by the time I get to Wogan I am absolutely deaf in one ear <gasps> which is a singer's nightmare. Yeah. You can't hear what you're doing. In fact, you can hear partly what you're doing, but most of the noise you're getting is through vibration yeah. through your head and internally. So I get to do the, the Wogan show and, man, it was like it was real un underwhelming. The performance, it was just barely passable, but it was like I, had to, I struggled to keep it all in and to hear what I was doing. So I had that one moment, and, you, and you're trying to pop a few smiles as well because it's TV and yeah, you've got to yeah, look yeah. squeaky clean. Yeah, yeah, mum and dad are watching, things like that. And then ultimately, I remember coming back from that thing, it was so deflated. My one moment to do Wogan and my, I get, you know, I get a, a yeah. deaf ear. Yeah, so you had to have decongestion or... Yeah, it, need, it needed just, yeah, it needed sort of um, to, be, to, 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 to be next few days to just sort of iron itself out. It was just really the station tube must have got a bit congested or I don't know, the compression. It did it to Marvin as well. So ultimately, it needed two or three days to sort of like come right. So it would never have come right in time for that, for that show. 
I mean, that's, 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 that's severe, but the, you know, people don't understand the, the process of yeah. looking after so maintaining the vocalist, you know. So you're up there and really you're screwing, you know. Yeah. Like, oh my goodness, mm. I'm in trouble here. Mm. But we but the show must go on. No nodules, never, <laughs> nothing like that in the past. No, no, I've never no nodules, no. I went to Touchwood and Whistle. I went to I trained with Glyn Jones and he he taught everyone, I think it was uh, I think his claim to fame was uh, Tom Jones and Olivia Ooh. Newton-John and Annie Lennox and a whole host of stars he taught. He's dead now. He's been dead a few years, bless him. And I did week in, week out with him. Wow. Yeah, doing the scales and around the piano. I mean, obviously, you get the odd time when you're really tired from overworking vocally. But ultimately, I've never ended up having those problems as yet. You said Lisa Stansfield. You've said um, a lot of different female vocalists. Yeah. You know, Annie Lennox. I mean, come on. Yeah. Is there any advice that they've ever given you when you've been in the presence of such seismic vocalists, you know, internationally, nationally? Mm. Is, is there any advice where you're just like, oh, I'm never going to let that leave me? That, that's something else. <laughs> From a vocal point of view. From a vocal point of view. Yeah. It's a bit techers, but I'm, I'm... Yeah, I can't a, remember yeah. who, but I remember people saying to me, like, keep away from drinking spirits and stuff like that because the way it dries, it dries it out. I mean, I don't drink. I've done my hangovers in the 90s, so mm. I, I don't really drink. Very, glass of one once in a blue moon. Um, but, yeah, it was always that. I remember someone, I can't remember who it was, said somebody, keep away from, from spirits. And that, uh, does that a proof Yeah, and I, so I never really was someone who went down that route. More, well, during the show kind of thing, drink your spirits. Just generally. Really? Just generally, mm. it, it ties, it, it kind of it aggravates it, yeah, it dries it out, mm. that kind of thing. That's the advice I got. And, I mean, the best advice I ever got was from, from uh, was, was really get, was someone putting me into Glyn Jones. Because mm-hmm. I was already having hits. And so um, it was Faye Simpson. Do you know her, Faye Simpson? No. I mean, she, she's a, she's sick. she got a gospel singer of the year back then in the early 90s. Oh, and wow. she was with a group called New Colours. Oh, I remember New Colours. Oh, she was yeah. unbelievable. She did backing vocals on my stuff, on, on some of my stuff, along with Carlene Anderson and people like that who did backing vocals for me as wow. well back then. Uh, on some of the was, tracks. Was, was Skin from Skunk and Nancy yeah, doing backing yeah, vocals yeah, for you? Yeah, she did one of the Top of the Pops with me. That's, that's incredible. Right. I don't miss a beat, me. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, you don't oh, that's miss Jack Diddley. <laughs> Come on, that was Skin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she did Top of the Pops. Obviously, before she became Skin and... And great vocalist. Even more successful than I've ever been. Uh, she's a... She's dead, 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 yeah, a great force, vocalist. Yeah. Yeah, so ultimately... Well, what was I saying? What was I saying? Uh, what new what Colours, my, yeah, vocalist, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Faye put me into Glyn. She said, you need to see Glyn Jones. Mm. And I'm already having hits. I'm already on top of the pops. And you, you suddenly think, well, maybe I do. If, she, if someone like her, as good a singer as her, is seeing mm. Glyn Jones for vocal lessons. It's got to be then, right. damn it, I must need it. Because she's in a different level to me. Different league. Mm. So I went to Glyn. And the first day I walked in, he went, I've been waiting to see you. Because mm. he'd seen me on TV and he was like, he must have known I need to see you. Mm. I, can, I can help you with your voice, you know. Mm-hmm. Do you... um? As you mentioned, a bit more broader question. Like, you you must know some of the newer soul acts and the, yeah. the R and B. The you know even the Children of Zeus. These kind of characters mm. that are just you know that they merge and mix uh, genres. Um, do you see a lot of what they're doing in the processes that you did as a as a young soul singer? Do you do you do you relate to the environment, the landscape of of now, so far as you know, because it's a social media world, isn't it? Yes, you know. But well, then again, it was different at the time because you were it was it was one route. It was major or not yes, at all. Yes, and it? you had to you had to work your butt off to break through the clubs, break through radio, break mm. through into TV. So it, it was just as difficult. Now I think if you want to break through on social media, you've got another millions of other people doing it. You've still got as much hard work on your hands mm. to break through and be seen as different from the rest, you know, or mm. unique in mm. some way. Um, I mean, I've got kids, so my oldest is 12, almost 13, so I do get a nice steady flow of what they're watching and what they're seeing. Oh, so, so that lucky. keeps me educated yeah. in a way, you know. That's super lucky, man. Yeah, because they're, 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 they're accessing music. They're not listening to radio, the radio like we did for the chart countdown and, mm. you know, see what's what's in the charts on a no. Sunday. They're not watching Top of the Pops. So mm. those, those things are gone. So they're, they're accessing it differently and consuming consuming it differently. Mm. I would say it's a lot more throwaway than it was. We would buy an album and read it, love it, yeah. treasure it. Believe that. 
go around to a mate's house, check this out, look who's playing, look who's produced, oh, look who's on bass, mm. look who's on drums or whatever. All of that, I loved that. Yeah. So they're not cons they're not treasuring it as much. as It's very much more disposable, as most mm. things are. You don't get things fixed. You chuck them now and buy a new one. Mm. So in that sense, um, I think that the um, there's a danger in that, that they won't appreciate some of the, the, the music they're hearing because some of it is good and some of mm. it's being produced as well. And, yeah, I relate to the way these kids are making music because obviously I grew up with the house scene and that was music made in houses, you know. <laughs> and... Um, and the whole the whole garage scene as well. So I see that they're they're able to access a lot more technology than we were, and we had to get we had to rely on getting in studios, and that was expensive. That's another thing, yeah. Yeah, rehearsal rooms, all that. But the downside of that is you've got a hell of a lot of people messing around with a lot of tech, making a hell of a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I listen to some things, and there's two twofold really. There's certain things my kids play at me, and I say, actually, that's a really old record. Mm -hmm. I know that record, that sample's from so-and-so, so-and-so. And I go, no, it isn't that, it's brand new. I said, actually, it's, it's older than me and that takes mm -hmm. some doing, you know. Um, <laughs> and, then there's like, and then there's the one where I say, um, like, can you turn it off, please, because the vocal doesn't go with the chords. I mean, they just don't match. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah, in yeah. different keys. Dude, it kills me. And she's, but this is a great, this is late, this is, this is uh, you know, this is trending, Dad. It's trending, it's, it's, it's yeah. trending towards the bin. Yeah. You know, that's where it belongs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is just... Uh, one of, I, think, noise. I, I think a lot of, I think a lot of uh, artists now, they, they buy the, the demo phase is them just getting recognised on social media with whatever they've got in their tank. Mm. There's no uh, development stage, do you know? Yes. Yeah, the record company would develop. Mm. So you would develop and you would build and build and you would just sort of start, start rehearsing and or some other artists would have started live and done a lot of live work mm. before they start recording. Mine was the other way around. It was mainly recording and the live work kicked in later. Mm. So the downside of that is my first ever gig with a live band, the first ever proper gig, concert gig was at the Royal Albert Hall and that was with Freddie Jackson, Lala Hathaway, Edwin wow. Starr, Lonnie Lister Smith, Incognito, Misha Paris, Omar, the list was uh, crazy. Incognito, Bluey, please don't get enough Bluey's love, a, man. He's a good friend of mine, Bluey. He's lovely man. He lovely is beautiful. Man. Yeah, good people. He's beautiful. Was he like, and again, just coming back from yeah. that era, man. It's... Bluey is amazing. When my, when my daughter, I don't want to go off on that tangent, when my daughter Christina fell ill in 2017 and we went for treatment abroad, Bluey was one of the first, and Omar and all of that crew, Jocelyn Brown, mm. Judy, all of them were the first to step up to do fundraising. Amazing. Hamish out of, uh, you know, the average white band. Mm. They were the first lot to step up and go, bang, we're going to help Kenny race and doe to enable me to go backwards and forwards from Germany for, for medical That's treatment. That's incredible. Bluey, Bluey is a unique, a unique human being. Mm. And mm -hmm. he's an amazing human being. Yeah. And musically, just, I mean, I've done records with Bluey. And my wife, my wife is a singer, has made records more recently with Bluey mm. and vocaled on them. And he's, he's just a, he's a, He's a powerhouse. He's a yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of of vibes. Science, music. Scientist of vibes. Yeah. Mm. Oh man, Bluey. And he goes back further than all of us because he, uh, you know, back to the you know the the, the Brit, Brit funk thing. Yeah. You know, the light of the world. The Giles Peterson kind of. Yeah, yeah man. Mm, mm. Proper. Yeah, Giles. Yeah, Good another stuff. another yeah, another yeah. legend of the yeah, game. Totally. Talking of legends, so uh, your your. Uh, your chain of events continue. So UK yeah. Soul uh, tour. It's cool. Uh, you have to the remember Brit that. Soul Ascending tour. Ascending. Because uh, when I saw it, I was like, "Oh, this feels like." What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Just it, it feels to me like uh, m uh, missiles that you know are pointing directly on on us, knowing full well that this, yeah. this is an era and defining genre that. Is on the attack. Yeah, I think what it is is just trying to sort of build upon and, and give an idea of the trajectory we've been on since in the last two years. We're just building the touring thing. It's ascending. Yeah. As I said, of course, you know what happens when things ascend yeah. and they get to the very top. You know yeah. what they have to do after that. <laughs> it's all cycles. But it's just we're in a process of like we're building this. We're building the touring and we're making, you know, some great records. So it's, it, you know, as late as it is in the day for mm. me, it's still ascending. It's a beautiful it's a beautiful image to conjure and i think that's it's not it's not it's not suggesting anything more than be a part of this be yeah. you know inclusive in it be mm. reminding us that it's still a huge huge these names we've talked about on this podcast yeah. alone the relevance <laughs> no. in them even now is still present it's just such a beautiful romantic idea ascending the ascending yeah. of it 
And you've got to take a risk, haven't you? You've got to do, you know, push the boat out and you've got to go for things. Uh, uh, certainly even musically and all the rest of it. And that means that you always always run the risk of falling flat on your face. Yeah. And that's not a problem because you can, you learn from all of those. I mean, look at the risk. When I think about my days when I was going over to America and signed over there, I remember going to um, a gig with um, Ice T and he was with Jane's Addiction. Do you remember that? He was always a big metal head, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah, I and I went that. to it, and I remember seeing this gig going, whoa, we have got hip-hop here with Jane's Addiction. This is, this is insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then amazing. it worked in its own way, in its own crazy way. Mm. But you look at it, you thought, well, he's just, he's just taken a real risk there. Yeah. And then where's his life ended up now? Acting and, yeah, yeah. you know, are you going to set the own limits on your own life? Are you going to allow the person you are today get in the way of the person you could be? I'm not prepared to let the person I am today get in the way of who I can be. Mm -hmm. You know, he has to step aside and just and just realise that as long as I'm open, open to all possibilities, all sorts of different yeah. outcomes. Well, it goes back to your... No limits. No, and it goes back to your curiosity of, like, you know, Chinese medicine and, and yeah. alternative remedies and, you know, even writing a book about this thing, you know, I guess writing a book draws mm. a line in the sand. But when you say, you know... You, uh, soul ascending is is his future forward. It's a future forward, yes. Prospect. It's you're telling it's a, an affirmation almost. Yeah, just saying we might just have a, a, you know a, a few elements of uh, fortitude in there that yeah. we can keep going in the face of all adversity. But even doing this podcast with you, the initial reaction we've had, Ed's, you know, he's a lot mm -hmm. younger than me, right? So his fingers on the pulse, very clued up. I'm an old boy now. So the things when it when it came with this, they thought, well, look, this is so trendy what you're doing in the street art. Rest. So I thought, where are we going? What are we going to talk about? I'm just a, I'm just an old soul boy who made records, you know, that '80s and '90s. <laughs> and then I got here and realised, damn it, we know so many mm. of the same mm. people. Mm. The, the, yeah. the lines have crossed. It all I'm, works, you know, baby. It all works. I know it's, it's crazy, man. Yeah, this but is yeah, a... we keep going. Yeah, as, as you do, and then all of a sudden you turn a different corner and you're into a whole new landscape. Mm. And that's what life is like. Oh, welcome to the podcast landscape. Thank welcome you, to brother. the Killer Thank Keller you. podcast. Landscape. Street culture, TV, television landscape. Kenny Thomas inside the place. And you know the deal. We're keeping it fresh, keeping it new, keeping it progressive. Archiving as we go. Uh, Killer Keller podcast. Out like it was out of fashion. Thanks so much, Kenny. That was so sick. Pleasure. Woo! Bless you, man. Bless you. Yeah, we're done. Uh, you know what to do. Sharing is caring. Tell a friend to tell a friend, all right? Uh, don't talk to anyone. I wouldn't. You stay lucky, people. Peace. Oh, <laughs>